what should I do? And I heard Yeshua say, tell them who I am. Tell them who I am. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you who he is. Now, we went over six weeks, over an hour each week. So you have, you know, the average sermon today is like 25 minutes. You have 18 sermons, 18 weeks of sermons in, in today's economy. And it was very scholarly and very theological. And I'm not a theologian. I'm not. I know some people think, I, I think I have good theology after reading the Bible and studying it, I think I, I understand doctrine and God's doctrine, but I am not a theologian. If you think I am, you think wrong. And if God told you I am, he didn't tell you. Okay, theologians are, are different animals, but every man of God and every teacher of God should have excellent theology. Okay, the doctrine should be spot on, it should be biblical. This is something, this is something different. So let's, let's just, without further ado, I just wanted to give you a preface it so you'll understand why we're going in this direction. Let's go to the first slide, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, we're in John 21. It's the last chapter of the universal gospel. Um, John is, is written to everybody. You know, there's, there's the gospels. The reason why there's four is because they really have four different audiences. And I can't get into the bits and bites, but just like there's four living creatures and there's four directions and there's four colors in the, in the curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, there's four gospels. And Matthew, you know, was written to the Jewish people. It speaks about Yeshua being king. They were looking for a king. Okay. And also it has a very distinct Jewish genealogy. Um, Mark was written to the Romans. The Romans wanted power. They were all about strength. So they wanted the bullock. They didn't want the lion. They wanted the bullock, the servant, the one who would give their life for people. And if you look at Mark, it's very short because it doesn't speak uh, much about teaching. Mark is not alive. It speaks of miracles, power, power. And then, of course, Luke is a beautiful gospel, probably, probably the most beautiful, really. But this was written to the Greeks, because the Greeks were philosophical, and they were trying to find the perfect man. And that's why Yeshua is referred to as the Son of Man, not the Son of God. But, but John is a, a very power-packed uh, gospel. It's very universal. It's for all people, anybody, anywhere in the world. And um, it really speaks to Yeshua's divine and unique identity. Um, this is the very end. This is the last Torah. Now, we know that he taught the disciples for 40 days. But guess what? Nobody knows what he taught. And for you to postulate is really a mistake. Do, do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Don't put words in God's mouth. You have enough in the Bible to postulate. <laughs> so we don't know. We don't know. And guess what? If we were supposed to know, it'd be recorded. Don't sweat it. It was for the disciples, okay? Not for us. So here we go, last Torah. It says, after this. Now, what is after this? And don't say John 20. <laughs> it says, Yeshua appeared again to the Talmudian, those are the disciples at Lake Tiberias, and here is how it happened. So, what, what just happened, what happened that now, because the scene switches. I'll give you a hint, okay? So I know how bad you want those t-shirts. The hint is, they were just in Jerusalem. Okay, I'm giving it away. Now, they're at Lake Tiberias. Stephen? Put away that phone. How dare you cheat in my class? <laughs> Gary! I need hands. Remember? He did, but, but why is it switching from Jerusalem to the Sea of Galilee? Not because of Thomas. I'm not trying to be difficult. I want you to think. This is before that. This is after this. Peter hasn't fished yet. The crucifixion, the resurrection did happen, my dear, but why were they in Jerusalem and now why are they in the Sea of Galilee? Passover is over. 
And what else happens in Passover? Because Passover, they don't have to be in Jerusalem. What do they have to be in Jerusalem for? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And how long is the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Seven days. So that has transpired. That's why they were in Jerusalem. They have to be there. Every Jewish boy, no matter where they live, has to go to Jerusalem. According to Deuteronomy 16.16, 16. if they didn't, they'd be violating the law. They'd be in sin. So they're there. But after this, it's over. So what do you do when a feast is over and you're, you're in Jerusalem? You go back home. You don't want to keep spending money at an inn, and you don't want to keep sponging off your friends. You got to go home. So they're going home. They're traveling north to the Galilee. I will give you a t-shirt. The judges say, fine. You want my jacket? Lily's cold? Yes, we do. And if you're ever cold and a man doesn't give you his jacket, what do you say? Bye-bye. You know what, I don't know what to give you. Just pick one of these, and then you hold on to them, and then you're going to distribute them as the, as the right answers come. <laughs> okay. So, Passover's over. Now, it tells us later in John, why, why do I do this? Do, do you think I do this to show you that I know something? You'd be so wrong. You wouldn't even know me. I want you to learn how to study and understand because it is a sad state of affairs that a Jehovah Witness after a year knows their Bible better than a Christian after 30. You're being stunted. You're being stunted. It's not right. It's not fair. So it says later on that he appeared. This is the third time. This is third appearance post-resurrection. When was the other two? Post-resurrection happened in chapter 4. Anyone? He appeared to Mary at the tomb, went, went in the upper room. When was that? When does it say? Well, you've been preaching for 70 years. You, are you kidding me? It's not even a high-quality T-shirt. I'm only kidding. I was only kidding. Give him a T-shirt. He gets a t-shirt. Yeah, he, he appeared to the disciples that night. Okay? And I'm, the reason why I'm doing this is not goofing around. I'm trying to set something up. And Thomas wasn't there. So he appeared to Thomas about a week, a week later. And give one to Billy too. A week later. Okay? Thomas wasn't there. So he appears to the disciples because they don't believe it. He says to Mary, Miriam of Magdala, not Mary Magdalene. That makes her out to be Greek. She was Jewish. Everybody's Jewish so far, okay? It's a Jewish place. It's all Jewish. The whole faith is Jewish, okay? Yeshua wasn't Jewish. He is and always will be in coming back that way. Anyway, Miriam of Magdala, the place called Tower, and she tells these guys, Yeshua resurrected. You think they believed her? Of course not. So he's, he's doing a beautiful thing. He's helping dispel their doubt. And he shows up that night. They're all there except for Thomas. He knows all things, so Thomas is doubting. So he shows up a week later and takes care of Thomas's doubt. Because Thomas has a mission. You can't have no doubt when you've got a mission for the Lord. There's no room for that. So he takes care of that. Now it's after this. How, how much after? A day? Three days? Your guess is as good as mine, but I think shortly thereafter. And the disciples are found on the Sea of Galilee. The the feast is over. And Yeshua now is going to take care of something quite beautiful. The story to me is the most stunning and beautiful story to show Yeshua's heart. More than hailing the lame or the leper or the lost. This is amazing to me. So because God gave me the opportunity to teach on it, I shall. So the Lord appears to them on Lake Tiberias. And John is about to tell us how everything went down. Now, let me say something. I'm going to repeat it twice. Everything that was recorded, everything that was recorded happened. But not everything that happened was recorded. And that's not my opinion. 
That's John 20, 30, 31. Okay, so if you will allow me some autistic license, what I like to do is paint a picture. I'm not a fundamentalist where I, I read words and just repeat, well, it says in uh, James 3, 1, who's James? Who is he writing to? Why are you starting in the third chapter? Why are you giving me one sentence? Who would do that? Who would do that? Who could understand that? Can you imagine if you didn't know who I was or who Bernadette was and says, well, Rabbi Greg's letter to Bernadette in the third chapter said, can't you be a better wife? (laughs) Now that's taken out of context, isn't it? (laughs) So if you'll allow me, I want to help fill in the blanks because I want you to start reading the Bible like this. And if you spend any time with me, you will. And you'll get a much deeper understanding. Because if you rent a movie and you turn off the video and just listen to audio, you're not going to get much out of it at all, are you? You need video when you read the Bible. So let's go to the next couple of verses. We don't have a lot of scripture. It's not going to be a big theology here. Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter, and Toma. Why do I do this? I want you to get used to the fact that this is Judaic. Okay? They were together with Natanel from Cana in the Galil, because there's two Canas, so they want you to know where it was. The sons of Zabdi, James and John, and two other Talmudin. Who are the two other Talmudin? Don't know. It's not important. It's not important. Otherwise, it would have been recorded. Shimon Kepha said, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're coming with you. They went and got into the boat, but that night they didn't catch anything. So we have seven of the disciples present and accounted for. Simon Peter decided to go fishing on the lake, and the others said, I'm going with you. Now this is my take. When you have somebody, a friend or a family member who's very depressed, almost suicidal, you don't want to leave them alone. My take was Peter was very depressed and suicidal. How could he not? How about if you were one of the top disciples? You were a rock, a Gibraltar of a man. And you deny the Lord three times. You don't think that would be depressing? Guys, you've got to read into it. You've got to get involved in the story. It can't just be words on a page. God is bigger than a God in the book. Now, I got a a few questions for you. This is not for a t-shirt. These are rhetorical, but I'm trying to share a message with you. And it has to be built for you to get the impact of it. What do you do when you failed a friend? What do you do after you've cried until you're numb? What do you do after you've replayed the failure over and over and over again in your mind? What do you do after you've run yourself down and you can't think of any more names to call yourself? You find some way to hold back the pain. I don't know what that means, but if you don't, you're going to kill yourself. Because that's the only way that you can be free. And usually what people do is when they've failed, they go back to what they're familiar with. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now, I don't know if he was just going fishing or he was going to tie a millstone to his neck. The galley is pretty deep. I've swam in it many, many times. Before we, we lace into Peter or before we critique Peter, I want to defend Peter because he's not here to defend himself. So I'm going to tell you that Peter was a rock of a man, a Gibraltar, 
of a man. Look at Matthew 4, 18, 20. This is very early on. As Yeshua walked by Lake Kinneret. Question. Why is the name in the Old Testament called Kinneret, and now we call it the Sea of Galilee? By definition, it's not a sea. Is that a big deal? No and yes. Because what else do we mess up? It's a lake. It's not a sea, by definition. But why was it called, and, and I think in, in the first time it's called that, is maybe Numbers 34.11. It's used again in, in Deuteronomy and Joshua. What is, what's Kinneret mean? Well, you're going to get a t-shirt, but you didn't raise your hand. This is a, you're going to get a t-shirt, harp. So if you look at the Sea of Galilee, it's shaped like her, and therein lies the name. Okay, just so you know. All right, so Yeshua is walking on the lake. This is where he lives. He lives up in Nazareth. He's starting his ministry. He's walking on the lake, and he's going to call his first disciples. He's a rabbi. This is nothing, this is nothing out of the ordinary. There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rabbis, and they each had a teaching, a different type of teaching. A lot of it was similar, but there was different, you know, you had different schools of rabbis, just like you had different schools of the prophets. And he's going to call his, some students that he's going to teach for a few years. And he comes up upon two brothers who were fishermen, Shimon, known as Kepha, and his brother Andrew. Commercial fishermen. What they've been doing their whole life, ever since they're a little boy, because their fathers were fishermen. Fishing. All night long. And then, you know, I know that people think this was like maybe a small guy. I don't know if you've, have you been to churches where you see a picture of the Last Supper? What? No offense. First of all, it's, it's Passover. It's not the Last Supper. There would not be a loaf of bread on a Passover table. I'm just saying, that's, that's. But they're all blonde. There wasn't a Jew who was blonde. They're all white. There wasn't a Jew who was white. And they're all effeminate. They all got long hair. Do you know that Yeshua didn't have long hair? According to the book of Corinth, according to everything we know to be true. Now, somebody once said to me, Rabbi, you're wrong because he was a Nazarite. No, you're wrong. He was a Nazarene. He never took a Nazarite vow. With that being said, Peter, if he didn't, it wasn't like the fishermen today, commercial fish. He had to pull those heavy, thick rope nets all day, all night long. And then he cleaned all the fish, and then he sold it to put some food on his table. He was a macho man. Strong. Now, what I want you to see, though, that's not what I want you to see. I just threw that in. You should give me a T-shirt. He says, Yeshua says to him, come after me and I'll make you fish as a man. Meaning, this is over for you at once. When's the last time you did an at once with the Lord? And I'm not talking about when he says, give that guy 20 bucks. That's not a big deal. I'm talking about leaving your livelihood. I'm talking about leaving everything you know near and dear. I'm talking about leaving your pocketbook behind and following the Lord. So many people have that chance and they blow it. Because I can't do that, Lord. Why not? Do you know if you give up everything for the Lord, you don't think you're going to have experiences that you'll never have reading a book? You think the Lord's going to shortchange you? I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars and the Lord called me one day and I gave it up. Bernadette married a rich man. We went on a honeymoon. I met the Lord. I came back. I was cleaning toilets for $5 an hour. She married a rich man. That will test whether why she was there. My mother said, you need a psychiatrist. You've lost your mind. Son, you have a company. You're successful. How do you just give that up in a day? I didn't think about it. Why did you come to Macon and leave everything you know near and dear with a wife, a homeschool, and three little babies for 24 grand a year? What were you thinking? I wasn't. If I was thinking, I would have talked myself out of it. I'm impulsive like Peter. I'm impulsive. And he was enthusiastic. He didn't think. Because if you think, 
If you think, you're going to talk yourself out of it. Stop thinking. And start following. Okay. That wasn't for everybody. Let's move on. At once, he gave up his livelihood. He was married. Do we know anything about his family? We know he dropped his nets and followed this man. Man, that's a strong man of God. Next, Matthew 14. I just want to build a little case for. That should be a 14. No, next, go next. Don't look at me like that, Roxanne. I told you to correct that. (laughs) Don't go. She's like this. I hope he doesn't say anything. I'm not going to embarrass you in front of everybody. What kind of person would I be? Okay, Roxanne and Denise are two that I know everybody loves. They are secretaries, they are ministers. I've been around, trust me. They're diamonds in the rough. In the rough. So this is Matthew 14, okay? I want to show you how Peter displays ridiculous faith. All right? No, no. It's 14. Go. She messed up. See, it's supposed to be 1 4. She just put in the 4. Okay? So keep this right where it is. Immediately, he, that's Yeshua, had the Talmudin get in the boat. He had just fed 5,000 people. So what was he showing? I'm your provider. Now he's going to show something different. He's going to do another miracle to show I'm not just your provider. I'm your protector. Immediately he had the Talmud team get in the boat. What's he doing? He's doing something. Why did he have him get in the boat? He's doing something. When God has you do something, just, just follow. He's trying to do something for you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to teach you something. He's trying to deliver you of something. He's trying to inject you with faith. I don't know, but just, just do it. I mean, Nike didn't say just try it. Where did they get off? Immediately he had the Talmudin get in the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. The crowds, the people he just fed. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. He's going to get the juice. He's going to God before he does this. He's like, Father, film me. Night came on and he was there alone. But by this time, the boat was several miles from shore. I think it's like... 18 miles long by about four miles wide, Sea of Galilee. And it was battling a rough sea and a headwind. Look, he's in control of the the weather. So he stirred it up around four o'clock in the morning. So they're rowing. I mean, nightfall, they've been rowing and rowing and they're going nowhere. I don't know if you've ever swam against the current, a strong current, but it's brutal. I don't know if you ever rowed into a current, but it's brutal. These are wooden oars. They were battling a rough sea and a headwind, coming right at them. Around four o'clock in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the lake. When the Talmudin saw him on the lake, they were terrified. I mean, it's rainy, it's windy. They don't, it it would look like a ghost, an apparition. They don't, they don't, you can't see when the, when the water is smashing against your face and the waves are coming over the boat. Waves on the Sea of Galilee? Yes. Yes. Because of the cold winds coming out of the north? Yes. They've had massive waves on the Galilee. They were terrified. It's a ghost. They're exhausted. It's four in the morning. They've been rowing all night. They're exhausted. They can't think straight. Mentally, they're fatigued. And they screamed with fear. It's natural, man. And it's natural. Okay, look at the next slide. But at once, there we go again. There's Pete. At once. Yeshua spoke to them. Courage, he said, it is I. Stop being afraid. There's 12 of them in the boat. Who called out? Now, some people will say that. I've, I've seen and I've heard the alone say, well, he said, if. That shows doubt. No. No. It shows just the opposite. I don't know who you are, but if it's you, call me. That is not doubt. Are you crazy? If it's you, if it's really you, I can't see. I don't know who it is. If it's a ghost, you can't call me. If it's you, I know your voice. 
sheep know the voice of the shepherd. He knew Yeshua's voice. A voice is the most distinctive thing about a person. If it's you, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. He says one word. Yes, Peter, it's really me. Because remember, we just fed the five that with Peter. Remember when I first, come. One word. So what does Kepha do? Immediately. This is a storm. These waves. I mean, it's crazy. Is the guy looped? Who would do this? Peter immediately gets out of the boat. And make no mistake, although he sunk after a while, he walked on water. You try it. That's my boy. Next, Matthew 16. When Yeshua came to him in the territory around Caesarea Philippi, we just went over that. He said, who, who are people saying the Son of Man is? Well, some are saying Yochanan the Immerser, a.k.a. John the Baptist. Others said Eliyahu, Elijah. Others said Yedimiahu, one of the prophets. But you, he said to them, all of you. You know what? Is that what they're saying about me? What are you saying about me? You know me, right? You've been with me. Who do you say I am? Nobody said a word. There was 12 of them again. Right? Right? They spent the same amount of time as Peter did. Nobody said nothing. Peter, I don't even think he looked around. I can't believe nobody's saying nothing. Peter jumps in. You are the Mashiach. That's huge, guys. This is the first person to get a revelation from on high about who Yeshua was. That's huge. So let's not, do do I get a t-shirt now? Peter gets a (laughs) t-shirt. Sir, if you can give Peter a t-shirt right now, I recommend psychiatric help. (laughs) Just saying. Okay, next, next, one more, one more incident. Matthew 26, 47 to 51. While Yeshua was still speaking, Okay, this is at the end. He's ready to be arrested. He's going to be betrayed and arrested and tried and killed. So he's giving his last words to his crew. While Yeshua was still speaking in the Garden of Gethsemane, Yehuda, Judah, one of the twelve, came and with him a large crowd. A large crowd. I don't know. A crowd is not a dozen people. Carrying swords and clubs from the head Kohanim, the temple gods, Roman gods, some other in the entourage. Maybe a couple of people in the Sanhedrin just decided, I'll grab a club. Let's go get them. The betrayer had arranged to give them a signal. The man I kiss is the one you want. Grab him. One of the worst things to do is get a Judas kiss. I've been kissed more times that way. He went straight up to Yeshua and said, Shalom, Rabbi. And kissed him. Look at Yeshua. Friend. Do what you came to do. Then they moved forward, laid hold of Yeshua, and arrested him. I don't know if Judah really knew what he was doing. I'm not, I'm not giving him a pass. I'm just saying I don't know if he knew the magnitude. But it's okay, because Yeshua was just using him. Yes. Nobody took Yeshua's life. I know people always say, well, my sins put him on the cross. No, his will put him on the cross. You don't get the credit. (laughs) At that, one of the men with Yeshua reached for his sword. Who's one of the men? How do you know? How do you know? No, 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 it tells us. Where does it tell us? What are you reading? Mark? No, you're guessing. Where is it? John? Where? You already got a t-shirt. You're double dipping. Thank you. I want you to go over to that man who's been preaching for 70 years and tell him, you didn't raise your hand. I want to witness that. No, no, you're right. I think it's funny. It's okay. It's good to have a good time in the house of the Lord too, you know? People are so religiously uptight. I wouldn't want to be witnessed to them by them. There's no, there's no reality. There's no genuineness in most people's witness. It's so stale and so unanointed. It's pathetic. Where is it? John Where? 
18. Who said it? Give him a t-shirt. Did you look it up? Did you look it up? You're looking down. You looked it up. You know what? You give me a t-shirt. Do not give him a t-shirt. Are you kidding me? It's like cheat sheets. Yes, you got to cross-reference. It says in John 18, 10 that, that he drew the sword. Okay, let's move on. All right? So at once, one of the men, Peter, reached for his sword. What? You got a crowd of people. Drew it out and struck at the servant of the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, I, I don't know if you realize this. Maybe you don't, so let me enlighten you. Peter was a fisherman, not a swordsman. He missed. People think he was, he, you know what I mean? Like he was Antonio Banderas, you know? I'll just take your ear. No, he wanted to take his head. He missed. Peter's aim was as bad as his judgment. You know the saying, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight? Let me tell you my saying, you don't bring carnal weapons to a spiritual war. Everybody's like, hey man, I'm going to use that one. No, you don't. It's ridiculous. You're fighting a spiritual war. Carnal weapons don't work. Doesn't work. So yeah, he was, he was out of his mind. But he unleashed his sword as if to say, take your filthy fleshly hands off my Lord. Good for him. Good for him. His judgment might have been off, but his heart was in the right place. Yes, guys, I'm trying to present to you that Peter was a rock of a man. Very few like him. A rock. He doesn't pray about things. Follow me. Let me pray about it. Oh, come on. You know what you're doing? You know he called you. You know what the Lord said. You're praying and you're going to ask enough secular people till they tell you, no, I wouldn't do it. When people tell me, Rabbi, I'm going to pray about it. To me, that's like, well, I want him to think I'm spiritual. When God tells you to do something, there's nothing to pray about. Are you sure? <laughs> Seriously? But this rock of a man can't get past his dreaded betrayal. Now, let me tell you something that I've experienced in 25 years of ministry. Something my mother told me when I was a five-year-old. And I wish you guys would get this message more than anything else. She said, son, you could do a hundred nice things for a person and do one thing that they don't like, and that's all they'll remember. There are people here that I've cried at their feet over their marriage, cried when they weren't crying, gave up food and begged God to heal them, paid their mortgages, paid their kids' books in school, couldn't do enough. Not only are they gone, but they say the most detestable things about me and my family that aren't even remotely true with no fact at all. How does that happen in the body of Messiah? I've never had that happen in the world. I've had a few fist fights with guys in a bar, and then we had a beer late, and we played softball. Has anybody experienced this? I experience it all the time, though. All the time. So I want you to understand me. I adore people. In fact, if I'm not around people, I lose it. Ask Byrne if my mother was here. She'd tell you, I, I, I don't like to go to the bathroom by myself. I'd like somebody there, and I just talk to them. <laughs> I love people, but after you've been bit and bit by the people closest to you, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You hide, but listen to what happens to me. I hide, but I'm miserable. Totally unhappy. Horrifically unhappy because I'm, I'm preventing myself from doing what I love, and that's being around people. But then if one more person says to me, I'd give you my heart, and then they talk bad about my family, I can't, you know, you just have so much you can bite. You know? We used to live uh, by New Smyrna Beach. It's the shark biting capital of the world. I had friends surf. Okay, I have terrible balance, but they surf. They got bit. They got bit, but they go back because they love surfing and they're willing to risk it. But when they get bit a second and third time, they hang up their board. What happens when you get bit dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens by the people that are closest to you? I don't mind a stranger giving me the finger. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm number one. You're number one too. (laughs) 
So if, if sometimes I seem a little aloof, don't think I don't love you. Just understand, there's very little left of me to bite. So Peter just can't get past the betrayal. Here's the betrayal. Let's see why. Luke 22. I didn't think this was going to take so long. I hope you're not upset. Luke 22, it says, having seized him, so they grabbed Yeshua, they led him away and brought him into the house of the Kohen, the high priest. They're going to try him. They're going to give him this, this ridiculous, ridiculous trial. Okay? You can't try anybody according to the Torah unless you have two or three witnesses. So they're already against their own Torah. Kepha followed at a distance. Okay, he's following. He's following. Make no mistake. Kepha was following. He couldn't follow right on top. I mean, they've got all the guards. But when they had lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard, you know, there's a, of course, what do you think the high priest lives in a mansion? He's got a courtyard. So they sat down together. Kepha joined them. One of the servant girls saw him sitting in the light of the fire and stared at him and said, wait a minute, this man was also with him. He denied it. Lady, I don't even know, I don't even know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them too. But Kepha said, man, I am not. Like now he's getting emphatic. Okay. One of the gospels says he cursed. He didn't curse at them. I don't know if you know about Judaism, but somebody would say like, I should drop dead. I swear to God, I didn't do it. And that's where they're trying to really defend themselves. Okay, look at the next slide. About an hour later, another man asserted. So this is the third time. Emphatically, he's like, come on, man. There's no doubt. We hear his accent. He's from the Galil. We know him. He was just in Jerusalem for a week at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We know him. Kepha said, man, I don't know where you're to stop. I don't know him. <coughs> and instantly, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Kepha. They locked eyes, man. This is the guy that he left everything for. He walked on water towards. He made the great profession of faith. He cut off the high priest servant's ear for. And now all of a sudden, three times, and Yeshua goes, oh, right in his eyes. And he is done crushed and he goes outside when it says he went outside and cried bitterly that means he cried inconsolably that means nobody could make his tears stop nobody it's over for him it's done it's over okay and i i, I need you to put yourself in his shoes and try to imagine what this poor man is feeling so now let's go back to the story we're done with with, I just want you to know who Peter was, just in case you didn't. I'm sure you did, so forgive me for being redundant. John 21.3, I'm going fishing. Now, he's going fishing for a lot of different reasons, but one, he wants to get his mind off things. I know we do things just to get our mind, to clear our mind. All he knows, he's a fisherman. I thought I was a disciple, but I'm not. I'm a bum. I'm worse than a bum. I'm worse than a worm. I don't deserve to live. But I'll go on the water. Something I know. Familiarity. And I'll just. So he goes fishing. But Peter finds out something that we've all found out. You can't shut off your mind, can you? Nope. Nope. You could do it with drugs. But then once you sober up, as he's fishing, this is my take. This is everything that was recorded happened, but not everything that happened was recorded. My take is he's fishing and he's reminiscing. He's thinking in his mind. And he gets a little smile because he's thinking, I remember when we first met. I remember when he first called me. I was one of the first. And I dropped everything to follow him. Man, I remember how I walked on this water. It was the best day when I made that profession of faith. I was so proud of myself when he looked at me and he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. 
I felt so special. And man, I did not want them to take him in the Garden of Gethsemane. I would have fought all of them. But I guess I'm just the guy who's going to be known as the one who betrayed Yeshua. So where do I go from here? I can't go back, but I can't go forward. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. He can't get his mind off the betrayal, and it's killing him. Just killing him. Let's see what happens next. (laughs) However, see, just as day was breaking, Guys, I don't think that when Yeshua came in that first night after his resurrection, all the disciples were there. I don't think he spoke to Peter much. I think he hugged each one, and I think he hugged Peter and whispered in his ear, Shalom, Shalom. It's good to see you. And Peter probably just couldn't even hug him. I think when he showed up a week later, He still didn't say nothing. Peter wanted to hide. I I don't want to be here. I'm so afraid that he's going to say something. And he is on a mission. And his mission is for Peter. Yeshua stood on the shore. They're out fishing. But the Talmudim didn't know it was he. I've, I've swam almost across the whole galley in the morning. I like to swim when I'm up there. And when you're 100 yards away and day hasn't broken yet, you can see people a little bit on the shore, but you don't have any clue who they are. So this is not far-fetched at all. And he says, they don't know who he is yet, but he goes, you don't have any fish, do you? He's bringing him right back to the beginning. Don't you remember he said this to him at the very beginning? He's doing a do-over. It's crazy. No, they answered. He said to them, throw your net on the right side. You'll catch some. First of all, if you try to do anything for the Lord without being directed by the Holy Spirit... Good luck. I'm not even sure I could pray for you. But know this. When you are directed by God to do something, there are no empty nets. So they threw in and they hauled in this huge amount of fish. There was 153 of them. I could tell you what that means, but I'm going to leave you in suspense. I'd rather you dream things up like all the other nutty people do. There was 153 languages that time. What? Who knew that? It's more of a miracle than what it actually means. But that's not important, okay? They didn't recognize him. It's not light yet, okay? It's it's still kind of dark. And they're fairly far from shore. We'll find out exactly how far they were, okay? Look at the next screen. The Talmud Yeshua Love said to him, who was that? What gospel is this? You don't say. It's the Lord. He's like, you know, they're getting close and he he knows. He's like, oh my, it's Yeshua. Like, what's he doing here? He just showed up. On hearing it was the Lord. Here we go again. Simon showing his true character. He threw on his coat, his outer garment, because he was stripping and plunged. You know what that word is in the Greek? It's balo. It means to let go of everything without caring where it falls. Friends, this is faith. We don't have that kind of faith, but that's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. You know that story, everybody's heard it a million times. I shared it with a pastor yesterday where the guy's on the tightrope with the wheelbarrow and he yells to the crowd underneath, do you think that I can push this wheelbarrow and walk on this tightrope and get to the other side? Everybody's like, yeah! And so he does it. 
And he gets to the other side and he yells, do you think I can do it again? And this one guy's like, definitely. He says, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Faith isn't calculated. When you're holding on and God says, give me your hand, you're going to hear, give me your other one. Yeah. Plunged in, man. I mean, he realizes it's the Lord. He is feeling awful about himself, but he's not thinking. Peter doesn't think. He acts. He's not analytical. He acts. And so he jumps in the water. It says they're 100 yards away. Now, I don't know how many of you swam 100 yards. It's not a big deal, 300 feet. But when you're going full out and you're taking in water, when you get to the shore, you can hardly stand. And I think when he got there, I think he dropped to his knees right at Yeshua's feet. That's what I think. Twenty-one nine and 15. When they stepped ashore now, now the boat has arrived after them. They get to shore, the other disciples. They saw a fire burning with coals and fish on it, and some bread. Yeshua had breakfast already prepared. I'll tell you why I think he had breakfast prepared. Not because he was a great host. I think he wants to get Simon alone. You know, you give people food. If I throw you some food, I can, I can pull, pull, you, pull, pull your kids away from you because you'd be like, ah, ah, ah. where are the kids? Who cares? Ah, ah, ah. It's free food. Ah, ah, ah. I don't even know what I'm eating with. <laughs> so, you know, I've been on the galley tons of times. They're, they're eating. They're full. They're feeling pretty good. Yeshua never embarrassed anybody. I think Yeshua said to Peter, come take a walk with me. I think he threw his arm around them, and they started walking along the galley. That's what I think. I think as important it is to hear what Yeshua did say to him, it's just as important to hear what Yeshua didn't say to him. For instance, some friend you turned out to be. I'm so disappointed in you, Peter. So, so what was the deal with you when you said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you? Or, man, you, you call yourself a disciple? So what does he say? Do you love me? <sighs> what? Yeshua is not there to inflict pain. Yeshua is there to relieve the pain. When Yeshua said, do you love me? And don't get technical, don't get caught up in the agapeo and the phileo, or you're going to lose the message -o. <laughs> Yeshua is saying, I still believe in you, Pete. Yes. Yeshua is saying, you're still the right man for the job. Yeshua is saying, remember when we first met, you didn't choose me, I chose you, and I'm still choosing you. Yeshua is saying, let's get on with it. We've got work to do. We can't sit around here like so many of us do on a couch with a shrink. I got news for you guys. Okay, just hear me out. Freud is the father of modern day psychology. Freud was an absolute mental case. Out of his mind mental case. Now hear me, when you go to your therapist, you are telling your therapist your side of it. They know nothing. They don't have a crystal ball. So they're giving you their opinion based on the information you're giving. You're only giving your perspective. No offense to the doctors here, but you don't know nothing. You say, where's the pain? You tell me, doc. You got to tell them things. You got to tell them where the pain is. You got to, then they got to do testing. I'm not saying there's not a place for therapy. I'm saying don't overdo it. Okay. Get with Yeshua. He won't have you on the couch long. Amen. 
I mean, guys, what do you see today? Come on. I have stats for you. I can give you stats. We have more therapy. We have more information. We have more resources. And people are more crazy than they've ever been. We have everybody yelling out, love, 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 love. And there's more hate than I've ever seen in the world. I'm 60 years old. I've been all over the world. All over. And then he says, check this out. He says, and if the answer is yes, if the answer is that you love me, feed my lambs. That's why when he was getting so upset with the Gentiles because they knew nothing, Paul had to say, Pete, did I hear the story right? When you were restored and Yeshua said, if you love me, feed my lambs, what are you getting so upset about? I used to get upset with you guys years and years ago until one lady came to me and said, look, we don't know much. That's why we're here. And I was like, ooh, okay, I'm sorry. Because I was thinking, how did you not read this or study it or learn it? But that's, that's not nice. That's not a good teacher. A good teacher cares about their students and wants them to get as much as they can out of the teaching. So I apologize for that. I tried to do a turnabout. He says, feed my lamb. So the underlying lesson of this story for us, for us, is that love for Messiah is the only acceptable motive for serving him. And we show that love, we demonstrate that by loving God's people and feeding them his word. That is the only way. So when I find myself in a cave because I'm tired of getting kicked and beaten up when I've sacrificed my life, my health, and my family, I put them on the freaking altar... Because after a day with everybody's problems, I don't even have time for my own kids. And when they are talking to me, I'm not even hearing them. And then I get kicked on top of it. So I find myself in the cave, and then I'm sitting in this musty, dark cave, and I'm even more miserable. And then the Lord says, you know, you've got to go back out there. And I'm like, do I really? He says, no, but you're going to hate staying in that cave. And I go back out, and for a season, people are nice, and then they go on the critique show. You have no idea what it means to do this job, sweet pea. You're clueless. But this was the great turning point for the Apostle Peter. This rock of a man, and this goes for all of you, he was a rock in his own strength. He had to be pulverized in order to become a boulder of a disciple. It happened for me. I was a rock of a man. I was just like him. Crazy, would do anything. There's nothing I wouldn't do. Jump off a cliff, anything. And God pulverized me. I mean, buried me. And then he started to build me back up and we're still in process. He would go from denying he ever knew Yeshua to just seven weeks later, right? In fact, Less than seven weeks, because it's already a week past Passover. Maybe five weeks later, maybe four weeks. Delivering the third greatest sermon. T-shirt time. Why do I say the third greatest sermon? What were the first two? Hands, don't yell it out. Sermon on the Mount Mount was the number one. Give that lady a T-shirt. What was the second greatest sermon? Hands. Because you know me. See, I've discipled you. You know me. Three years, Peter. Three years. Yes, make his right. The second greatest sermon was his mother's. Give him a shirt. And throw him an extra buck. His mother had the second greatest sermon. What did she say? Whatever he says, do. Whatever he says, do. But this is the third greatest sermon. He preaches a sermon... And 3,000 souls, 3,000 Jews in Jerusalem, in the temple court, come to the Lord and form the nucleus of the body of Messiah. Crazy, man. Crazy. Look what the Lord did for him. Look how he restored him. What kind of a friend inspires devotion like this? I'll tell you who. A friend who prayed for him when he was weak. A friend who forgave him when he failed. A friend who healed a painful memory. A friend who wouldn't give up on him. 
and a friend who first laid down his life for him. This is why it's so hard to, for rabbi to find friends. Romans 5, 7, 8. I got four pieces of scripture for you. Two slides. We're out of here. It says, now it is a rare event when someone gives up his life even for the sake of somebody righteous. Although possibly for a truly good person, I'll explain, one might have the courage to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that the Messiah died on our behalf while we were still sinners. Okay. Guys, this kind of love is unheard of. It is unique and unparalleled by anything in the human experience. Know this. The average man's life is precious to him, sometimes a little too precious. Precious. And he would not think of throwing it away for an unworthy person. For example, most men would not die for a murderer, an adulterer, or a mobster. In fact, he would be reluctant, it says, to die for a righteous man, meaning, a righteous man meaning, one who is honest and dependable, but not especially warm. We've met a lot of those, right? It is possible, Paul is saying, in an extreme case, that he would die for a good man, meaning one who is kind, friendly, loving, and lovable. But the love of God is completely supernatural, and my term, otherworldly. It's out of this world. Because God demonstrated his own love. You might say, Rabbi, I heard this a million times. When are you going to believe it? You can never serve the Lord until you fall in love with him. You will never fall in love with him until you understand what I'm about to share with you. God demonstrated his love towards us by sending his beloved son to die for us while we were still so sinful. If we try to figure out why he did it, we become baffled. We say, I don't understand. Why would you, why would you stop trying to figure out and embrace it? There was no good in us to call forth such unfathomable love. No good. Romans 5, 9, 10, and we're out ski. Therefore, since we have now come to be considered righteous by means of his bloody sacrificial death, how much more will we be delivered through him from the anger of God's judgment? For if we were reconciled with God through his son's death when we were enemies, how much more will we be delivered by his life now that we are? Okay. Now, now, right now, something new exists. We are no longer dirty, rotten sinners. At the huge, ginormous, priceless cost of Yeshua's bloody sacrifice... We are now counted righteous by God. We are reconciled to God when we were yet hostile towards him and quite content to have nothing to do with him. I wanted nothing to do with him after I left the uh, the Orthodox synagogue. I had nothing against him. I just had nothing to do with him. But God did not have the same attitude towards us that we did towards him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He intervened in a display of pure, unadulterated grace. If God would do this for his enemies, what would he do for his children? And I don't mean buy you a new car. I mean, what wouldn't he, how would he not protect us? And if he's letting us go through something, it's for our benefit. Will he ever let us go? No. No. For if Yeshua's death had such power to save us, how much more will his life have power to keep us? One final thought. I would imagine that once Yeshua finished with Peter and he left and Peter got back to the breakfast table, I have a feeling they wanted to know what transpired when they walked down the sea? Wouldn't you? And so I see it like this. The disciples say, so what did you guys talk about? Right? It's very normal. And Peter's saying, he just asked me if I loved him. And the disciples saying, yeah, but 
What did he say about the denials? And then Peter say, he never even mentioned it. All I got to say is, what a friend I found, closer than a brother. I have felt his touch more intimate than lovers. Yeshua, 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 friend forever. Let's stand together. If I um, don't hang around today, it's not because I don't love you. I'm in a ridiculous amount of pain. So I'm just going to lay down. So I hope you understand. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Yo Adonai pono velecha vehunecha. Yisa Adonai pono velecha veasem lecha. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, guys.